Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Um, it's being hosted by EDF Energy and the title is What You Should and Shouldn't Do When Building an Energy Efficiency Business Case. Um, presenting with us today, we've got Daniel Benson, who's Manager of Business to Business Energy Services Delivery at EDF Energy. Um, Daniel has worked in the low carbon energy sector for over 10 years and currently heads up the energy services delivery team at EDF Energy. Um, also presenting, we have Jason Stoyle, um, Engineering Manager at EDF Energy. Jason also has over 10 years experience and is currently responsible uh, on the team that is responsible for identifying, delivering and verifying the performance of energy conservation measures. The webinar will run for approximately 30 minutes and there will be some time for Q&A at the end of the session. If you have any questions, um, just leave them in the Q&A or chat box at the right hand side of your screen. Likewise, if you've got any technical queries, leave them there as well and one of the team will be able to get back to you. Um, anyway, without any further ado, I'll pass you over to Daniel and Jason who can take us on from there. Um, guys, passing over to you. Thanks, Charles. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, and firstly, uh, apologies to anyone who dialed in early. And, uh, we were going through testing of the IT and the connections, and you may have seen a few sneak previews of a couple of the slides and, and perhaps the video as well. So hopefully we haven't spoiled any, the ending there for anyone. Uh, so my name is Daniel Bentham. Um, as Charles said, I am responsible for the delivery part of energy services at EDF Energy. Um, and I will be taking you through the slides today with Jason, who is the engineering manager, uh, and Jason is responsible for uh, the engineering team, and as Charles said, uh, his team go out and identify the opportunities, work with our clients to help them reduce energy and generate their own energy on site. So, moving swiftly on to the presentation. Hopefully you can all see that. We've done introductions there. Uh, just give me a bit of a an overview of who we are and, and why we're speaking to you today. So uh, EDF Energy is a very large uh, organization. Um, you may well know that we are a, a large supplier of electricity to the UK market, but we're part of a very large energy group. Um, and as part of that group, we have interest in generating electricity, supplying electricity, gas and heat, and also offering additional services uh, alongside the supply of energy, uh, such as energy services, where we help customers uh, identify ways of uh, reducing their energy consumption, and that's across all forms of energy, whether that's heat, gas, or electricity, uh, or cooling. Uh, we help them design projects. We then project manage those projects for them uh, through to delivery. We'll measure and verify the savings, uh, and we'll also invest in those projects as well, if, if, if that's required. So today we want to talk to you about how to build an energy efficiency business case. So we work with lots of large clients in the UK and across Europe, um, and we see many common problems uh, when trying to convince them that energy efficiency is a sound investment for those businesses. So today we're just going to help you take you through some of those steps and share with you some of our experiences to date. So the first slide is uh, our, our interpretation of the UK energy landscape. Uh, you may have seen this before if you're an EDF Energy customer. Uh, and what we do is that we want to map out for our customers um, the complexity which they are faced when considering how they should buy, how they should use, and how they should generate their own energy on site. So it's not very easy to see the detail on this slide, but this is available. Um, and what we've done here is we've mapped out all of the um, direct and indirect uh, factors which they should consider when uh, looking at their energy strategy. So the next slide. We then think about energy efficiency. So once we've taken them through that landscape, we've made them aware of all of the factors that they need to consider, and they started to build up their strategy. Uh, we then say, well, the, before you undertake any works, whether that's consultancy, audits, or delivering projects, you need to make sure that you set up that program for success. Is to make sure that you consider all of those factors that we look at under the energy landscape and make sure that you are going down the right path to achieve your strategic goals. I think it's important to understand that in any energy efficiency program, it's not a quick fix. It's going to take some time to go through 
um, various stages in order to get a really successful program at the end of it. Uh, and typically we're looking for something between a year and two years to get the design phase done to understand what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, uh, and what the impact is going to be on the business. That's before implementation takes place, which again, depending on the technologies, could take anything from six months to two, three years. Um, so, as you can see in front of you, the, the number of stages we try to go through uh, is to take the client through a, a schedule of um, stages. First of all, making sure that they understand what they're getting into. So that the client knows right up front where we're going to take them, what the stages are, how long it's going to take to do, uh, and then take them through the, the various points. So once we've got the clients engaged and they're ready to go, we take them through a feasibility study. So we look at what the impact of the various ECMs, energy conservation measures, are going to be on their business um, and allow them to choose which ones are going to be the best for them, along with our experts. This really gives them an idea of the cost um, involved and the savings which they could realise before moving on to a detailed design phase where we, we really look into it more in-depth into the various ECMs to work out exactly what the costs will be and exactly what the savings. Um, and if they want to, we can guarantee those cost and savings at that point. Uh, the implementation, again, is very much a, a movable feast, uh, working around the client's requirements. So if it's a, a food manufacturing plant, making sure that we don't interrupt their um, manufacturing, their processing. Uh, if it's a hospital, making sure that we don't impact on the, the client comfort or the, the patient comfort levels. Uh, really, towards the end of the, the, the program, um, one of the most important stages is the m and uh, and this is really just the the monitoring and verification um, of the ECMs which are put in place. And here we're looking at verifying that the savings we estimated right at the front, right back in the feasibility and design stages, are actually realised, uh, and making sure that the client it recognises what the, the impact has been on their performance, on their energy usage. Obviously, depending what the implementation stage is involved, there may be a continuous O&M requirement afterwards, which can go up to anything 10, 15 years, uh, just to keep all the, the ECMs in full tip-top working condition. I think the, the stage approach is a very easy one to take the client through um, and really sets up for a successful project, but there are things which can go wrong. Uh, I think Dan is going to take you through a few of those things now. So we've looked at how complex the landscape is and there are lots of factors out there to consider. We've seen that although you follow a very methodical sequential approach through that staged approach, um, you can try and mitigate some of the delivery risks. Um, but what we found that if you don't set it up correctly, then you may come across some of the pitfalls now I'm going to take you through. Uh, and these are pitfalls which have been commonly found by our, our clients uh, through their projects uh, and it's feedback from them that uh, we've distilled and captured in, in, in this slide. So the first one is a, a lack of standardization. We find that particularly in large organizations where they have lots of different sites or lots of different areas within a site, um, there are discrete budgets or discrete roles and responsibilities and they may be undertaking very similar works but take it, undertaking very different approaches. So you find that there are, uh, there's a, a distinct lack of standardization across their estate, whether that's lighting, um, control systems, or heating systems, uh, which means that they are missing out on potentially greater uh, opportunities for energy saving, but also increased costs around maintenance and upkeep of those systems. The second one is around missed economies of scale. Sometimes when you look at energy efficiency projects, you look at small projects, you want to prove the concept, and then you'll piece by piece you want to then do more work. What we're saying is actually take a step back, understand the, the, the size of the total opportunity across your estate uh, to ensure that uh, you can deliver projects as cost effectively as possible through economies of scale. So if you're looking at potentially a rollout of lighting or a rollout of renewables, don't just look at one site, then look at all your sites collectively and see whether you can drive down costs. Then we have poor measurement and verification. Um, typically, as what we're seeing is that once a project has been given the green light and it's been delivered, um, very rarely do organisations truly measure and verify that the benefits case that they set out to deliver at the start is delivered at the end of the project. Um, what we're saying is that you need to understand exactly what 
benefits you're looking to achieve, whether that's a reduce, reduction in carbon, energy, or some kind of uh, cost benefit, um, that needs to be clearly mapped out and an M&V plan needs to be put in place at the end. Um, what we find is that if projects fail on that benefits case, it will be far more difficult in the future to get similar projects underway within those organisations. So it's about building up confidence within the organisations that energy efficiency projects, renewable generation projects are a sound investment for that business to undertake. It's vitally important in any measurement and verification process that you actually understand what your baseline data is. So without understanding exactly how you're using energy in the first place, you can't really then quantify how much you're saving at the end of the program. So, and that's one of the key aspects we find. People don't understand how they're using energy in the first place. And that leads on to the next one, which is underperformance. Um, sometimes people are quite surprised by how poorly their projects perform. They thought they were going to achieve 10, 15% energy reduction through this initiative, and actually they're achieving 2, 3, 4, 5%, and they don't quite understand why that is. Um, and a lot of that can be traced back to uh, understanding um, really was that the right initiative that they should undertake? Did they consider all of the factors? Um, and did they put in place the right measurement and verification plan? Because they may be achieving a greater uh, energy saving than they thought they had, but it's just external factors which are influencing their, their energy consumption. So underperformance is, is a pitfall and, and a complaint that we do hear from our customers, which they've had ex experience of previously from undertaking energy efficiency projects. <clears throat> then a stretch on internal resources. Uh, quite often our initial point of contact to, within an organization is the energy team. And I'm, I, I know that many of you are from energy teams in organizations. Uh, and really those teams are quite small specialist teams without necessarily the, the, the right level of resource needed to deliver projects. Um, so we find that if resources are stretched, um, whether that's in the energy t uh, team or whether it's in the engineering teams or the estate teams, then quite often projects either don't go ahead, or if they do go ahead, their their de scopes or investments is, is reduced to a point where actually they're not delivering the full benefits case. In many cases, clients for clients, the actual use of energy is not a high priority. The priority for them is looking after their patients, making their products, getting the the cars, biscuits, whatever it is, out of the factory, um, and therefore the energy teams aren't as well resourced as they could well be. Um, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to help them resource the energy scope, the energy projects which they want to undertake. Uh, so that leads on to lack of internal funds. Quite often energy efficiency isn't seen as uh, a potential route for investment for a business. It's not really seen as uh, a revenue generation uh, opportunity either for a business. So quite often it, it is the first thing to come off the list of, of projects which a company undertakes during the year. So that's, that's a, a key problem which our customers face. Uh, limited strategic breadth. What this means is that actually it's very much a, uh, a, a, reaction, uh, a reactionary type project where there is a problem on site which they want to solve quickly. Uh, and what they're not doing is taking a step back again and looking at the strategic opportunity there for delivering a, a more holistic approach for, for energy efficiency. Uh, product driven. So this is something which you do come across quite often where um, there are obviously companies out there like EDF Energy which are offering a service but there are obviously other companies out there which are more product driven and they're, they're, they're selling products. Um, and invariably energy efficiency is delivered through either changing operation or changing controls or changing products. So there's a need there to work very closely with those types of companies but what we're finding is that if you're purely looking at the products and rolling that out um, without looking at all of the potential opportunities, then actually you may be missing some energy efficiency opportunities there. Key to a successful energy project is installing the right product. So just because a, a product is new, is innovative, doesn't make it mean it's the right one for you. Um, and that's where the experts come into play, knowing exactly what the right product is for your particular um, circumstance. So this is something which has come from our our clients in the in the retail business, where they've undertaken a project um, and installed energy efficiency measures which save energy. They do exactly what was intended, apart from they are not aesthetically pleasing to look at, 
and these are in areas of their business where uh, they have interactions with customers, it's their point of sale, and this was a consideration which wasn't factored in at the start of the project. So we make sure that as part of our projects we consider that our customers' business as well. Is what we're proposing going to have an adverse impact on their business, whether that's uh, materially on their energy consumption or on their productivity, or actually is it purely through um, uh, either an adverse effect on, on public relations or point of sale. And then the final one we have, over-sophisticated systems. So we're seeing more and more that control systems are at the heart of energy efficiency measures and projects. Um, however, you've got to make sure that any control system which is deployed and used is, is used to its full capabilities and you're not over-specifying those systems. So we've had instances in hospitals, for instance, where the lights are on more or less 24-7 uh, and when they go off, people want to be able to just turn them on. Um, but there's been quite elaborate control systems associated with the lighting in those hospitals which just isn't being used and that comes at additional cost. It means that it has an adverse effect on the payback of those systems which means that they're actually delivering fewer lighting projects for the same budget which means that they're saving less energy overall. So, so making sure that the right control systems are used at the right time. So I'm not sure whether those ring true with people on the call but those are our top 10 pitfalls that we find uh, reported back to us from our customers. So the counter side to that are what, what works well within our um, within energy efficiency projects and programs and you'll be pleased to hear we've only got top four this time rather than the top ten. So what we find is that there needs to be uh, sponsorship from a senior level within the organization, board level ideally, um, so that they are involved in setting the vision and the direction of the energy strategy for that business and very importantly that they are there to set targets. So we want to make sure that all targets in the organization have uh, an energy efficiency, carbon efficiency, renewable generation element to them so that the whole business is being driven in the same direction. There needs to be a central energy team uh, and as we spoke about earlier this is very important to have that central team there to provide the drive uh, and to make the decisions at the appropriate times throughout the program and they're the key point of contact for us um, as an energy services business within an organization. Um, they're also the ones who are most committed to reducing the energy consumption of an organization uh, and tend to be the ones who are most committed to um, reducing the carbon emissions as well. Site teams, so quite often overlooked um, but they certainly shouldn't be. They are probably the most important uh, stakeholder in the whole um, energy efficiency program. Um, they'll be the ones who will end up using the systems uh, at the end of the day. They'll be the ones who will be responsible for maintaining those systems. And they also have a lot of very good ideas. They work with those systems every day and so they're a rich source of knowledge and insight. So they need to be involved from day one. Um, it's certainly in identifying the opportunities and identifying the barriers to some of the projects which have been put forward previously. They need to support and champion any initiatives which are put forward to the central team and the executive. Uh, and they need to be part of um, deploying the solution within that organization. If you don't have those key aspects there, unfortunately the project will invariably fail in the long term. So though you may get your initiatives underway and delivered within the organization, if somebody's not there to support it and maintain it, quite quickly you'll find that it's, it, 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 those measures do not deliver the, the benefits which you're expecting. We have found the, the engagement of the site team is vital to a, a successful project purely because they're the ones who know their sites best, they know the operations the best. Um, it, sitting in the central office you may not know exactly how the details work, but well, the site team work with it day in, day out, um, and they're the guys who will, as Dan said, be using the, the ECM in the long run and will support it and will maintain it. Without their engagement and their buy-in right at the beginning, the, the project is virtually doomed to failure. Okay, and the, the final one is that we would always advocate having a, a, a delivery partner there, somebody on your side to help manage the overall process, to make sure that there is accountability. So when we deliver projects, we are solely accountable for the success of that project. If we don't deliver on time, it costs more money, or if it doesn't deliver the benefits case that we said at the start it would do, that's, that's our responsibility. 
Um, you also want to make sure that that delivery partner is responsible for innovation. You don't want them to come in and just look at your site. It's just another site where they can deploy the same old solution that they've done time and time again. You want to challenge them to be innovative, to look at your site as an individual site, your organization as an individual organization, and see how they can tailor um, their response and their solution to your needs. And if you have all of those in place, then we say that you have happy clients, you'll deliver your energy efficiency, which will mean that uh, there's a, either a improved productivity, um, reduced costs, or even a revenue stream generated from that initiative. So alongside those four guiding principles, we have our top five tips for, for setting up for success. And this forms the, the first stage in a successful energy efficiency program. So if you remember back to the slide we had a few moments ago with the, the arrows, this is the first stage of the engagement site, which really helps up set up a project for success. So we've touched on this already, but the first key point for us is that the energy team or the engineering team or whoever is looking to undertake this program uh, needs to understand their organization. They need to understand elements such as procurement and budgets and governance. Uh, the reasons for that is that there's plenty of scope within an organization to either set an energy efficiency budget or actually look at other opportunities there for investing in this type of program. So there might be asset replacement budgets, there might be OPEX budgets which you can access um, to help deliver more, uh, more projects, more benefits for, for, for the business. Um, so what we would say is whoever you're working with as your energy services provider, um, get them to talk directly to your procurement teams, talk directly to your executive teams to understand exactly what can they do within the organization and what can't they do. And if there are uh, instances where governance can be changed or modified, uh, then how do they go about working with the organization to do that? The next tip is all about engaging with your decision makers um, as early as possible and actually recognizing who those decision makers are as early as possible. Um, and when, when we say decision makers, we actually mean a, a whole variety of people, people who will champion the, the ECM you're going to put forward, the, the project you're going to put forward, and those who then will act against them and will block any project. Uh, if you identify those up early, you can start talking to them, trying to get around the blockers or trying to convince the blockers that really they shouldn't be doing that, that this is in the best interest for their project. Uh, so the decision makers are on site, but they're also at very high level. Um, and part of the, the rollout of the ESOS over the last sort of eight months has been about engaging at that high level, making those decision makers um, accessible and knowledgeable about the projects we want to do. And as we've already said, the site, site personnel, the end users, key people to engage with early on, understand what exactly they want out of the project. It may not be as simple as saving energy. It may be improving the process itself. Um, by engaging with them right up front, you can make sure that whatever project is proposed meets what their requirements as well as the strategic aims. So our top tip really is to start meeting with these key decision makers as early as possible, at least six months before the organisational, uh, sorry, before the organisation sets its budget, so that we can get the project in the um, year budget and we can plan it into the right way. Okay, so our, our third top tip is that we you need to define a clear strategy and a clear set of objectives backed up by targets. Um, we say that. Yeah, a five-year plan is a great place to start, particularly this year, 2015, working out to 2020. It's a good opportunity there to try and sell a five-year plan within your organizations uh, to work towards that long-term target. Uh, what we tend to find is that if you, if you work on a piecemeal basis, uh, look at the quick wins and low-hanging fruit this year, you quite quickly exhaust all of the projects that you can deliver within the investment criteria set by your organization. So by having that long-term strategy, mapping that out for your senior stakeholders, they can see that you're actually delivering long-term projects for long-term sustainability for your business. <clears throat> so what we also find here as, as a top tip is try and include as many of, of the benefits into that conversation as possible. So we've worked with customers where they said we well, can't include the benefits around maintenance costs. You can't include the costs, the cost benefits from uh, your your carbon um, uh, obligations. 
what we're saying is try and build all of those into the business case because they do have an impact and whatever you can put into the business case to deliver more projects is only a good thing. Uh, that may require changes in your uh, procurement or governance process but it's worth investing that time to do that. And the fourth real tip is um, understanding how you're going to pay for it. Uh, and there's a, a variety of different ways of paying for something, be it off balance sheet or on balance sheet, third party financing, internal financing. Uh, there's you name it, uh, you can have as many as you want to. But the idea of knowing how it's going to be paid for right at the front, right at the beginning, is often key to unlocking those that money. Uh, and what we would really look at when defining the project is how best are your funds spent. Everybody has a um, a set amount of money available. Is it better to spend your internal funds on doing an energy project or would it be better to invest on your core activity and get a, a third party to finance the energy project which will pay back in, this, in the time. But understanding how you're going to pay for it right up front really makes things a lot easier as the project pro progresses. Okay, and I'll fifth some final top tip. Um, again, choose the right organisation to work with. Make sure that they are credible, they've got the right competencies and they're trustworthy. They have a track record of delivering this type of initiative. That they're able to talk with your organisation at all levels. So uh, they're not somebody who you, know, uh, you can't trust to take into the boardroom or you can't trust to take to site to speak to your, speak to your, your, your site managers and your site teams. Um, so they need to be a partner in, in the truest sense of the word. Uh, and a good indicator for this, we do recommend that people do this, is that uh, don't ask your provider uh, what has gone well, but ask them when things haven't gone well and, and how have they responded to that. Um, so make sure you do ask them when, has, when have they come across a challenging project and how did they uh, deal with that at the time. Okay. So that's our top five tips, and what we want to share with you now is, is how this has worked in practice for us. Uh, so it's just it's not just theory, this is something which we do practice every day. So what we like to do for a, a project is take a, a holistic view of the, the process in place or the, the project to be put in, um, to be implemented. Uh, and the, the methodology we, fo we follow is a optimise, reduce, generate methodology. So the first thing we look at is how the existing systems, the existing process can be optimised to reduce energy. Um, so it's more around checking for, for example, compressed air leaks, um, optimising how the, the process is run, doing some personnel changes, rather than actually implementing a project, um, implementing a, a process change. The next stage is reducing the energy use, uh, and that's replacing inefficient equipment with modern, more innovative technologies. Uh, anything from, well, I suppose light bulbs is the, the classic example, replacing the T8s with LEDs. Uh, and then the final stage is generation. So really, we look at on-site generation, be it PV or CHP, um, combined heat or power, as being the last stage. There's no point putting in very expensive uh, generation equipment if you're wasting energy further down the line through not having an optimised process um, and not having the, the right equipment in there in the first place. But by taking that... Sorry, yeah. sorry Jason. I think that's a very key point. What we find is that sometimes when you, you don't follow this process, you can effectively oversize the equipment, either the generation element or in the reduction element, um, without having gone through the energy efficiency element up front. So this is all about best practice and making sure that you deliver the maximum benefit for your organisation for the least cost possible. No, that's exactly right. And it's the it's being able to take that holistic view, being able to step back and, and view the process as a, a third party, which makes the, the energy service partner a really important part of the project team. Okay. So... An example where we've done this from end to end with one particular customer is a customer called United Biscuits. Um, you'll be familiar with their brands such as McVitie's. They've got a number of sites across the UK. And we worked with United Biscuits, first of all, to understand what their energy portfolio looked like. Um, obviously, from a, a UK perspective, so they have multiple sites across the UK, um, ranging from Scotland through to the, the Midlands and then further down. So it's a very complex um, matrix of stakeholders, both from a, a central team point of view, but also from the site guys. 
uh, as well. So each site was is run autonomously. Each site has been running for probably the best part of 20, 30 years. Uh, so they have a very deeply ingrained culture, uh, deeply ingrained process, which, as it works, why should they change it? Uh, so we were tasked really is going in there and identifying ways to reduce their overall energy spend, um, as well as their carbon reduction targets, uh, and working with them within their plan process. So we can't go in and say, what you really need to do is shut down this plant for six months, uh, and we'll come in and refit all the energy efficiency um, technology you can possibly think of. We have to work within the, the normal operational periods, and that's a, that's a key part of a successful project, allowing the, the company to continue to work as normal whilst you're doing these retrofits. So, because the theme of today is around setting up for success, we spent a great deal of time with the uh, client and the teams within the organisation at the start of the programme to understand who we would be working with, who are the key stakeholders, uh, and what roles and responsibilities do those stakeholders have. So we worked with the organization at three different levels. Uh, start at the board level. Uh, we worked directly with the finance director and the engineering director to understand what the investment criteria was for this organization. We said it's two year payback. It was actually 22 months, which uh, is, is, yeah, slight, makes it slightly more challenging, but also means it's very specific around what we need to achieve. Uh, they also set up the budget approval for this program, drawing on energy efficiency budgets, but also asset replacement budgets and OPEX budgets as well. So we're able to uh, educate them around the benefits of looking at all of those different budgets. Um, we then work with the project board, uh, and this was a mixture of senior and middle management. Uh, and they were the ones who owned the budget. Uh, budget. They, they were the ones who then uh, gave the green light to projects as and when we progressed them through the program. Uh, they also, uh, because they have uh, intimate knowledge of the operations and uh, workings of the sites, they also gave the approval for the different types of technology that we're looking to deploy uh, on those sites as well. And then, as I said before, the key one is the sites, working with the uh, site-based engineering and maintenance teams uh, they would review the technology to make sure that there was no immediate Im adverse impact on their operations. Uh, they would raise the orders and they would have used the equipment and all the new processes or the new ways of working uh, once we had then uh, removed ourselves from site at the end of the program. Uh, so they were very key as part of that. So working with an organization at those three uh, different levels it was very important to the success of this project. And it's not to be underestimated the amount of time it took to get to move from the initial engagement through to project implementation. Um, so it was the best part of a year to move through that process to make sure that everybody was happy and all the budgets were in place, the sites were ready, um, and the, the, the operational had been planned so that there was no impact on the number of biscuits being produced. So we have a, a very short quote from Paul Martin, who's the head of UK engineering at United Biscuits. Uh, so this approach to strategy development and the skills EDF Energy are bringing to the party will help us to keep making the great strides in reducing our impact on the environment and with all the wider benefits that brings to our company. Uh, thank you all for your time today and um, give you the opportunity to ask Jason and myself uh, any questions that you might have. Okay, thanks guys very much. That was very interesting. Um, as, as you've now said, we're, we're open for questions, so um, if you want to ask uh, Jan, Dan or Jason anything, just leave us a comment in the Q&A or chat box. Um, there are a couple of questions there already, um, so I think I'll kick off with, um, so we had one saying, you mentioned senior executive sponsorship. Do you have any specific tips for actually getting this kind of sponsorship? Will ethos help in this seeing as I think they're saying seeing as um, I think it's because in ethos you need uh, the a senior director to sign off the energy project. I think that's what they're yeah. getting at. Um, yeah, that's, that would be the question. So um, e ethos exactly will help with that. Um, the whole reasoning behind ethos was to get that senior engagement buy-in um, and it's been very successful in the projects we've done in give, uh, raising awareness of the, the various energy projects which could be carried out on a site. Um, I think there's a difference between getting the awareness level and actually implementing the projects. That's a, a whole different question. But uh, the, the first step is to get that awareness um, 
with the, the senior engagement side. Any tips on doing that? Um, I think the the best thing I can say is to make it very clear and very simple. Um, they ha need to have a, a very high level view of what the, the benefits are going to be for them uh, and how much it's going to cost uh, and who's best to, to place to help them to achieve those um, projects. It's, they don't have a lot of time to undergo, understand the details, the technical details of it, so it really has to be very high level um, costs against savings. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question we have is, do you have any tips for selling longer term projects like renewables to your board? Um, they might have a longer period of payback than typical allowances, i.e. two years. Yeah, so I think that's just the, the sort of argument renewables tend to have paybacks that can be sort of in the region of five to ten years rather than the two-year specification or, um, in your case, you were saying 22 months. Um, do you have any um, tips uh, on, on that one? Again, I think it's all about taking the holistic view. So you're right, in a renewable energy uh, system will take 10, 15 years um, to pay back, whilst an energy efficiency one should pay back in less than five. Um, by taking a holistic view and by being able to bundle them together, then you can reduce that overall payback significantly um, and make it a long, a, make a long-term project a, a short-term sort of um, prospect. That seems to work very well if you can get the the senior level engagement buy-in um, because they understand how the 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 company is going to move forward over the next 10 years um, and are more willing to take that risk and that upfront um, cost. I think uh, just to add to that, it's also worth, if you had the opportunity to go back to some of the question, so why do we have this um, payback period? Why is it defined as two, three, four, five years? Um, quite often that payback has been defined because that's the payback at which they're happy to either borrow money to invest in their estate um, off their own balance sheet or it's where they have cash available, that's the type of term where they want to see a return on that investment. Um, now, what you can then do is use that as an opportunity to open up um, the potential conversation for saying, well, actually, there are people out there who will be willing to invest in these types of projects for us. So there's no capital investment on our part, whether it's our own money or we're having to borrow it from a third party anyway. But we still get the benefits, or at least a proportion of, of those benefits. So I think it's worth not challenging them directly, but going back to them and asking why do we have these rules, why do we have this level of governance, um, and actually is it appropriate for this type of project, uh, and does the governance outweigh the benefits, or do the benefits outweigh the governance, and can we change it slightly? So I think it's worth having that communication with them, that conversation with them. Okay. Um, another question we have is, what do you believe will drive the next wave of energy savings for firms that have already made the quick wins, i.e. LED lighting? Um, will it be things such as more integrated slash systems thinking? Um. So just to pick up on the integrated systems, because I think that's, that is an interesting area. And it's a slide we haven't presented today, but some of our customers, if they're on the call, may have seen it from our presentations from last year is that when we look at particularly around generation, that customers should consider all of the, uh, their energy needs, whether that's heating, cooling, or power, and try and ensure that they, when it, when they consider on-site generation, that they have these integrated generation systems with smart controls and precision uh, measurements and metering. This will then open up the opportunity for um, demand-side response, uh, and those types of new schemes which are coming through from National Grid. So it's not strictly energy efficiency, but those schemes are being developed in order to uh, manage consumption and generation in a way which is beneficial to, to National Grid and to the country as a whole. Uh, and there are also lots of cost benefits there, and revenue benefits, around reducing your uh, costs around your electricity supply, but also then perhaps generating revenues from those schemes. So we certainly see that as a growing area. Around energy efficiency, um, Jason is... Um, <laughs> Uh, I think the what's going to drive energy efficiency moving forward is got to be legislation, um, regulation coming from central government, um, and also the desire for um, to be seen as a more uh, climate conscious company. Um, so I think we are moving now. He's done all the, the easy quick wins. 
um, and we're looking at longer paybacks, more expensive technologies to install. I think we are looking outside of the box and seeing what other additional benefits energy efficiency can bring to us. Uh, and I think that, so. What going back to that question, we can either look for the new technologies which fit that low-hanging fruit criteria, or actually we can work with organisations to try and change the criteria so they can do more work. Uh, and that's important because going forward, if we look at the energy bill and how that's made up of wholesale costs and non-energy costs, we've spoken with our customers over the last 12 months or more saying that actually going forward, the, the, the control over the bill and the cost of, uh, of energy is going to reduce significantly as the majority of the bill will be made up through non-energy costs, so the likes of GEOS charges and TUOS charges or the low carbon um, taxes which are coming in and have been in for some time, that's only going to increase. And the only way you can really mitigate the risk of, the, of your energy costs going up is by reducing your volume or managing your volume. And so when you take that argument back into your organizations to say, look, the world has changed and it's going to continue to change, we need to relax or change the criteria by which we invest in projects to reduce our energy consumption, to make sure we're more sustainable and we've got greater control over how much we use and how much we generate then that's really going to be the shift. So we can rely on central government to do so much in the short, short term, but ultimately I think the market will drive this behaviour because those costs are only going to go up and the only way you're going to mitigate those costs is by doing some work yourselves. Okay, um, and if I can just, I, um, I personally wonder, threading some of the, that discussion together, is that what you're kind of referring to when you talked about maybe looking at a kind of long-term strategy? So maybe what a company or an energy team might want to do is focus on those quick wins first, but at the same time present the long-term plan to include bigger things such as smart energy systems and renewables so that you know senior management can sort of see there's a, there's a grander grander plan in motion and that it's always easier to invest in something if you feel like you're part way through a process that's already delivered. Would that be a fair assessment? So um, what we do is we develop that long-term strategy and we communicate that strategy, but below that there's more than one route to delivering that strategy. And what we tend to do is map out scenarios. So it could be that under your current business as usual operations where you want to invest in the quick wins with very short-term paybacks, limited capex, no interruptions to your site, it will look like this and you'll get so far down that journey. Or if you look at it from the other way around, is actually want to achieve the, the end goal. How do we do all, this, all the work, but then structure it in a way which means that it's, it, it's, we, we attack the quick wins quickly or we actually use the benefits of those quick wins to then cross-subsidize the longer term projects. Now whether that's bundling those projects together to re produce an average payback or that's reinvesting the savings into future projects. Um, and, and really it's about tailoring that solution to the client's needs and giving them those, giving them the visibility of the options and then helping them make the right choice. Okay, great. Um, I have just got uh, there's one or two other questions. Um, so one, it's a bit more general, but is there any big changes coming along due to EMR, um, electricity market reform, that businesses should be aware of? So I think it's sort of any one or two big things that we need to be aware of. Um, so we, we haven't really, we haven't covered much of EMR in the slide deck today. We probably don't have time to cover it in detail because it is quite a complex issue. But I mentioned the non-energy costs and for um, electricity supply customers, that will be the, the, the key um, impact on their business is how much will EMR increase those non-energy costs going forward and what visibility do they have about those costs and how can they protect themselves from any large energy cost rises but also unforeseen energy cost rises as well because it's all about being able to manage budgets and forecast and all of this stuff. Uh, and so we've got um, material which we can share with people if they want to contact us separately about this. Uh, we've got Market, market Insight uh, publications which we can share which gives them that regular update on EMR. Um, but what we would say as an overall theme, EMR, uh, in order to mitigate the risks, you need to look at your volume and how you can reduce that volume. 
And in order to uh, take advantage of EMR as well through the new schemes that are coming through, you need to look at how you can integrate your energy systems and your on-site generation systems so that you can continue to operate in a way that your business wants to whilst making sure that you're changing your profile to match the requirements of, of the uh, energy market. So EMR provides both opportunities and also uh, risks to, to, to your um, energy costs. It's key to remember, though, that the, the projects we've been talking about today during this presentation are not purely electrical um, electricity projects. So when we talk about energy efficiency, we do mean energy in the broader sense. So it's electrical, gas, um, heating, biomasses. It's, the, it's the, the total energy projects rather than being defined purely by electrical. Great. Okay. Um, I think that's it for all the questions. So what uh, what I was going to say is um, I was just going to thank Dan and Jason for their time. Um, that was very informative. Following um, following this webinar in the next uh, day or so, um, we'll put a copy of it up on the Two Degrees platform. So if you think you've missed anything or want to go over anything, you'll be able to access it there. Um, also, if you have any questions that uh, come to mind that you forgot to ask today, um, you're welcome to leave a comment at the bottom of that page, and uh, Dan and Jason will be keeping their eyes peeled over it, and um, they'll be able to get back to you uh, there or directly, um, depending on what's most appropriate. Um, if there's anything else from either either of yourselves, Dan or Jason, um, I think what we'll do is we'll let we'll maybe just play out the rest of that video for anyone that wants to stay on, um, and then following the end of that video, I'll just close down the presentation from there. Does that sound okay? Yeah, sounds great. Perfect. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, like I say, everyone else, thank you for attending today. I hope that was informative. Um, and keep your eyes peeled for a link in the next day or so, and um, you can uh, come back and catch catch uh, catch up on what you missed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.